Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 3rd, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what we make of the current confused budget situation in the House. Second, We explain why we believe Representatives Rasmussen and Merrick dissemble when they say they oppose an income tax. In fact, they just oppose one that requires the top 20% to contribute. They don't mind one that mostly burdens middle and lower income Alaska families. Third, we discuss why we believe the argument advanced in a recent op-ed by Permanent Fund Corporation head Angela Rodell is disingenuous. And now, let's join Michael. So let's start out first with where are we at on the budget? Because, my Lord, I watched the supercut. Suzanne Downing put together a very funny supercut that was like 12 or 16 minutes of the floor, the seven and a half hour floor session on Saturday, at which point, at one point, Louise Stutes had her hand in her hands and she was cursing under her breath (laughs) because she was just like so frustrated. Give us a rundown of what took place and where are we at on the budget as we sit right now? Say the best, the best summary uh, of of what happened over the weekend and and where we are uh, is an article that James Brooks uh, did that's in the, that he posted in the ADN last night or posted on the ADN last night. Um, and it's uh, the the title of it is Alaska House postpones on state budget after slow moving debates consume the weekend. But he goes he goes through it uh, sort of blow by blow, and and it's 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 stuff that you might not have picked up as you watched uh, as you watched the session. Basically, it's a uh, it, it what happened was the the Democrats lost control. The the majority lost control. Uh, there are several quotes in the article from Adam Wool and others uh, about the fact that they weren't certain where the votes were going. Um, as as the amendments started rolling in, uh, uh, at times uh, uh, Kelly Merrick would vote with the Republicans. At at times, the new representative from the North Slope Borough would vote with Republicans. At times, Sarah Rasmussen would vote with Republicans, and then at times they would vote with the majority. And and as it went along, uh, as as Adam describes in the in in the quotes he gave to James Brooks, as it went along, the Democrats weren't quite sure where it was going, and uh, uh, were concerned that they were going to end up with a with a, a budget at the end of the day that you know the the, the squad wing of the House majority, the Garantar, uh wasn't going to wouldn't vote for it. And right. So they were they were. They were they were they were beginning to, to to lose control of the process. So that's what happened. I mean, it was it was sort of hard to figure out what was going on, but that's what happened on Sunday when everybody came back. The majority had decided that the best way to deal with this was to shut it down with the amendments that had been passed at that point, uh, and not allow additional amendments that might you know divide up the majority further. Right. Well, and um, to just give people a little bit of perspective, there were seventy two uh, seventy. I think it were 72 original amendments or 73 original amendments. And when they shut it down on Saturday night uh, and then Sunday morning, they went to shut it down and basically to, to stop debate. There were still 52 amendments that were unheard. I mean, that was seven hours to get through those 20 amendments. 
Uh, you could see, and in fact, I think Adam Wool said something about we we thought there'd be a little more predictability, and then it deviated. We wanted to stop and regroup and figure out what we where we want to go. And this is again them trying to control the whole narrative, uh, and it just got out. Of, it just got out of their hand. But there's still plenty of stuff left to uh, to discuss. There is, and it's and it's really I, 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 the predictions I've seen or the statements I've seen is they expect the, it to come back out of rules. Uh, this afternoon, but but there's a very 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 narrow needle that has to be threaded here between holding the 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 majority together uh, enough to to get a budget vote, yet you know satisfying the concerns of the of the minority to have votes on amendments uh, still to be heard. Uh, and they threw it back into rules to try to figure out what that process is. Uh, if they can if they can develop a process that does that, I, it's a it's a fairly narrow needle. So I, I'm not sure where this goes. I, the, the concern that, that James picked up on was that several amendments that were yet to be heard, uh, uh, several from David Eastman, were going to tie uh, various pieces of the budget, various pieces of spending to various social, to social policies. He had done that. He'd been successful in doing that with one amendment uh, on Saturday, which was the amendment to uh, tie the uh, the reopening of the uh, uh, the Capitol building to right. uh, to a certain date um, to, to to the budget uh, the funding from the budget uh, and the concern was at least uh, as as James picked up on it the concern is that you know several of those amendments were going to attract votes from uh, uh, Merrick and others and, and, and get, and get inserted in the budget. And then, you know, you lose the, the squad wing of the, of the house, uh, of the house majority. So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see, very interesting to see how this thing, uh, reemerges. It, it is a lesson to some degree in what happens if you don't have, uh, an obligation in the majority to vote for the budget. If you don't have the, the the binding caucus uh, provision because the majority doesn't have the binding caucus which is why they've they've been losing uh, on some of these votes uh, and it's and and it's instructional of, of what happens you can see why a speaker like Chenault would uh, would insist on the binding caucus uh, so you didn't you didn't go through this you the minority could bring up the amendments and you could just sort of sit there and strum your fingers because you knew every time on an amendment that you would have you would be able to uh, to be successful on the vote. They don't. The, the majority, the majority, this majority doesn't have a binding caucus, and so we're sort of finding out what the consequence of that is in a very, very, very uh, 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 tightly divided uh, divided house. It's interesting to watch again. <clears throat> it's also a lesson in what happens when you don't have a super solid majority. When you only have a majority of twenty one, it does vest a lot of power in those swing votes. One or two people can really. Uh, can really you know make a change in there and and throw a wrench in this and you could see it again in Wool's words of you know they were looking for this predictability like they thought they they knew which way it was going and it also shows that again that dictatorial style that we've seen in the past from the coalition majority in the past couple of years where they basically have rammed things down the throat of the minority all of a sudden when the tables have the ability to be turned. This is you, this is what happens. This is what happens when you treat them badly, and um, and and they have the ability to push back. Which I mean, I, quite honestly, I'm happy to see this process is not supposed to be orderly. This process is not supposed to be a coup d'état or a fait accompli. It's supposed to be uh, it's supposed to be messy, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. There's there's one thing that uh, that isn't picked up in James's article that I think uh, this process has shown. And that is that the governor would likely have 16 if he wanted to make uh, if he wanted to make vetoes at the end of this process. Uh, it's shown that there's a fairly solid core, uh, at least on the on the minority side, that's that's sticking sticking through these votes, that's voting very cons- voting fairly consistently. Uh, I mean, there's a question whether the governor, you know, is is, is going to wants to go back to. To, to what he did in 2019, um, but but it's showing that that there is a fairly solid a fairly solid core on that side, and you only need 16 between the two um, between the two bodies to, to uphold vetoes. So uh, 
the 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 question is, you know, you you might lose a few minority members in the House, but you would you've got you know you, uh, uh, Shower and you've got Shelley and you've got others over in the Senate that could that could step up for some of to to you know fill out the sixteen for some of that. And I I'm not sure. I mean, this puts a lot of pressure on the governor in a way, right? Because it's sh- it's showing that there is this this fairly solid minority. Uh, that is that is in the mood to support getting you know a, a better budget out of this process, um, and it's showing that uh, they're sticking together, um, and and so the the question to the governor is: Are you going to use? I mean, we we've, we've talked about this since the election. Are you going to use that power that you're being given by these legislators? Are you going to use that to 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 reform the budget, or are you just going to you know, keep on keeping on the, the way you have the last two years. So it's, um, it, it, this process is far from over. This pro- I mean, we're only in the House. Uh, we, we haven't gotten to the Senate yet. We haven't gotten to the conference committee yet. We haven't gotten to the governor yet. Uh, and, uh, and this process is, 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 is far from over. One other thing that this is showing that uh, there is, it's not going to be close on uh, on the reverse sweep this year. There is a there is a powerful minority that looks like it's there to to, to block a reverse sweep, um, and, uh, and and so they have negotiating leverage coming off the reverse sweep, uh, the ability to block the reverse sweep, and and it's not clear how that's going to play out either. But but I but I think this process is showing that the minority does have significant power. They're sticking together. Um, and, uh, and, and, and maybe that's going to result in, uh, in even further changes down the road. Uh, somebody in the chat room said, it sounds like you're talking like a proponent of the binding caucus, uh, but what is happening is the way it's supposed to work. I don't think you're a proponent. I think you're just pointing out why people like Chenault had clung to the binding caucus in the past, because otherwise it is definitely harder to kind of herd all the cats, so to speak. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, uh, I don't think you're necessarily supporting the idea of a binding caucus, right? No, I've been, a, I've been an opponent of the binding caucus since 2014 when Gabrielle right. Ledoux came after me, right? For for you know not supporting her because of that. You know, pe- people take my words and twist them all sorts of ways, don't, yeah. don't they? Exactly. Anyway, I I I've, think you've been an opponent a long ago, a long opponent of uh, of of the binding caucus. I think this is the way it should work. I think you, I think you do have to. You know, a binding caucus is really what that sets up is a majority of the majority. So if you've got a if you've got a, a 25, uh, say a 25 or a 24 to, to do this right, a 24 majority, then 13 really control the house because 13 within within that within that caucus will set the policy of the caucus, and then the other, you know, the remaining 11 are obligated to to, to vote right. for it. And I've and you know, Denny Hastert did that when he was Speaker of the of the of, of the House in, in Congress. I was a big opponent of that then. You you need to find a consensus in a in a in a world where you've got a very divided electorate, uh, and that's what we've got here. I mean, we've got we've got a, a, a very divided electorate. You, you you've got to you've got to find that middle ground, and a binding right. caucus doesn't let you find that middle ground. Any projections, uh, predictions on where you think it's going to, you know, where we're going to go here on this before we move on to number two? Well, I, they ultimately are going to find a way to try to thread the needle through the House. Uh, I, I suspect it will stay closely divided uh, as it goes through the House. Laban and, uh, and, and, and your, your two favorite Fairbanks reps, Laban and Thompson, have said they want to vote. They, they, they plan to vote for the budget. Uh Steve actually used that as one of his as one of the reasons why they needed to stop the or they needed to hear out the minority votes because he or minority uh, amendments because he wanted to vote for the budget but he wanted that process to work its way through. Um, they will find a way to work it through the House, but I, as I say, I think I think we've yet to see how this plays out. The minority is demonstrating that they've got power. Uh, it will show up in the. Uh, uh, the reverse sweep, uh, and it may show up in the governor. And I, the, the good part of this process is the minority have shown that that they're able to stick together, that they're not being divided, that they're able to make some progress. Uh, and I think that's empowering, empowering uh, the minority in a way that 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 they are going to actually be able to help uh, shape how this budget comes out. Brad's right. Sometimes people hear things that they don't. They you know they hear things that are not there. 
Jamie says, and this is a follow-up to the comment about how the Binding Caucus, and, and again, I know where you stand on this, Brad. I know that you've been against, you and I have been against the Binding Caucus forever. He said, you shouldn't use words like consequence when describing what's happening without the Binding Caucus. That's insinuating something is wrong since there isn't one. Again, don't hear what Brad's not saying. Brad has been staunchly against the Binding Caucus. He's just saying this is a consequence of not having it is that it becomes the messy normal process, which is not a bad thing. Consequence is not a negative word, but I just I thought I'd let Brad comment on that before we move on. Oh, uh, it's I mean people people read into it what what they what they what they want to or people listen into it what they what they want to. I mean, you, all you have to do is go back to 2014 though. I had a huge falling out with with uh, Gabrielle Ledoux and others about uh, uh, about the Binding Caucus, I was doing uh, endorsements and I was, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, contributions uh, back at that time. And uh, and I uh, I had supported uh, Gabrielle in previous election cycles. I publicly opposed her uh, in the 2014 election cycle uh, because of the Binding Caucus. One of the issues I had raised in 2014 the binding caucus uh and there was a huge fallout i mean we we right when it went at each other publicly for a while so it um <clears throat> yeah i yeah I, i've been there for a long time but you know chenault chenault was a, a strong uh, a staunch supporter of the binding caucus because you know it gave him the power to control the process uh uh you know uh, to sort of listen out listen to the to the party but to but to control the process, and uh, and Chenault just you know stuck with it. That was that was how he ran the House. Um, and that's, I, that's been the argument too from many Republicans as to why they needed the Binding Caucus for that exact reason because they wanted to essentially run the table. Um, you know, this is the same thing that Lance Pruitt said. It's the same thing that uh, has been said by uh, other members of the uh, of the Senate. Uh, in the past, this is why they needed that because they they needed that power to be able to basically. It's the tyranny of the majority at that point because then you can basically control the majority, and, and it invested the power. This is one of the reasons why Geisel had so much sway uh, in the last legislature is because again, with the power of that binding caucus, you could have just a handful of people controlling everything at that point. If you're if you're the leader, you absolutely want it. Right. You absolutely want the majority of the majority, because you've been elected with the majority of the majority, and 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 you know you can you usually can count on count on those supporters um, uh, to to back you up, and and once you get the majority of the majority, you've got the caucus bound, and 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 you control it. If you're a leader, you absolutely want it. But if you want the best result, if you want a result that 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 blends together. Uh, finds the middle ground, finds the finds the, uh, uh, the 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 settling point, the balancing point among all of the members. Uh, then you don't want the caucus, and uh, right, and it, that, yeah, I mean we, that's been part of the problem that we've had in the last decade. We've had strong leadership uh, who've had absolute control, and you know they've said we're going to spend the SBR and the CBR down. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to halt spending. And as long as you had the majority of the majority backing you up, uh, uh, that's that's the direction we went. I, I I think this I think this process, though a lot more messier, is going to lead us to uh, hopefully a better result. I I would agree, and I, I think that's how the process is meant to be played. It's meant to be messy. Number two is up next. This is the three thousand dollar vote on the dividend, which you say um, shows us uh, how some of these folks have come to embody kind of this uh, top 20% that we've been talking about. Give us a tease for this before we go to break. Well, Sarah Rasmussen and Kelly Merrick uh, have been saying things throughout that that I think demonstrate uh, clearly that they've sort of become the spokespeople for the 20%, the protectors uh, of the 20%. Uh, it, shows up in, uh, it shows up in their votes on the PFD. It shows up in some of the other statements they've talked about on revenues. Uh, it shows up in their votes for... Uh, for the budget, and uh, and and I want to spend a while talking about that because I think it's a very clear example of of what we've been talking about about how uh, the top top twenty percent are reacting to the to the budget crisis. The weekly top three. We just gave you the tease for number two before we went to break, which of course is how the uh, top twenty percent are in embodied at this point 
by uh, two of our pivotal members, Sarah Rasmussen and uh, Kelly Merrick. Brad, you've got a take on this. Uh, hit us with it here as we go through. Well, here, here's the deal with with Rasmussen and Merrick. Both of them ha- ran on uh, a platform of no income taxes, um, and that's okay. I mean, that's that's that that's a position one can take. Uh, but they they've also been uh, supporters of PFD cuts, which are income taxes. The way to avoid income taxes on anybody, uh, on either the the top twenty percent or the the remaining eighty percent, which is which are you know PFD cuts or income taxes on the remaining eighty percent, the 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 way to avoid income taxes on anybody is to cut spending, is to is to reduce spending. Um, and Rasmussen has sort of <laughs> she she's been cute about this. She's talked about the fact that she wants to cut spending. But when push has come to shove, she really she she hasn't been there uh, on those votes. And there's a there was a a, 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 a situation on the during the House consideration on the floor on Saturday that really just sort of brought all this together. Uh, after Kevin's uh, after Kevin made his, Kevin McCabe made his proposal for an amendment to uh, to restore the PFD, uh, Sarah. Uh, proposed an amendment. I think this is the way it works. Sarah proposed an amendment to Kevin's amendment uh, that would cut spending uh, down to uh, down to as as you were describing before, uh, roughly half uh, of current spending levels. Um, and Sarah made that uh, to make a point uh, about you know what the consequence would be if you tried to uh, if you tried to pay a, a full PFD. Uh, and not replace those revenues uh, with something else. Um, and then Sarah withdrew that proposed amendment, uh, saying this: the reality is Alaska's Alaskans across the state are still asking for services. She said the Matsu is still asking for troopers. Anchorage is asking for K through 12 education. Fairbanks wants the University of Alaska funded. Kenai Peninsula wants their roads plowed. Coastal Alaska want Coastal Alaska wants their ferries. Rural Alaska wants affordable heat, uh, and then she and 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 with that explanation, she uh, withdrew the amendment, essentially saying we can't, we're we're not going to be able to uh, to cut spending to be able to uh, to afford a PFD. Um, but here's here's what what's missing uh, in what Rasmussen and Merrick are doing. Uh, there is another way to, uh, and and they're they're going down this road. There's another way to 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 deal with the situation, and that's to cut the PFD. I mean, if you don't cut spending, and you're not going to you're not going to have you're not going to tax the have an income tax to top the to tax the top 20 percent. The other way you do it is to cut the PFD. That's the way you create the revenues right uh, to balance the budget, and that's the road they keep going down. I, and and it's and it's you know it's the top it's it's the top 20 percent. Don't tax me. Uh, don't tax the top 20 percent. Don't tax you. Don't tax uh, Alaskans who want uh, government uh, uh, spending. Tax uh, Ala- tax uh, those behind the tree, which is which is cutting the PFD. They 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 don't they don't want the top twenty percent to pay. They don't want to cut spending when when it's all said and done. They don't want to cut spending. So what they're doing is taxing the imposing an income tax on the remaining eighty percent of Alaskans through PFD cuts to pay for government. And that's a significant chunk. I mean, you've got a graph up uh, that you talk about. I mean, it hits the lower income Alaskans somewhere between the thirty five and fifty percent mark on the impact of just cutting the PFD versus any kind of other offset or reducing the size and scope of government, that PFD cut definitely dramatically affects those folks. It does. It does. I mean, it's a reverse income tax. I mean, Rasmussen and Merrick will say all day long, we don't want an income tax, but then they go and vote for an income tax. It's just, it's just an income tax on the remaining 80%. What they really mean when they say that is we don't want an income tax on the top 20%. We don't want it. We don't want a, a, a revenue measure that 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 requires actual revenue from the top 20 percent we're willing to accept a revenue measure that takes money from from everybody else it's a it, it is it is a don't tax you don't ta- don't tax me tax that guy behind the tree approach and 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 they and they and they don't see it i mean either they don't see it or they're just not going to admit it 
that what they're that what they're imposing is a reverse income tax. If they truly don't want an income tax, then then they've got to press on on spending, but but they don't do it. They 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 press on the on the PFD instead instead. Right. Well, <clears throat> so that's uh, that's number two, that's number two, and I think again it just shows that these uh, these ladies have consistently. Uh, played word games, you know, again, with not wanting to tax people while at the same time advocating a quasi-tax anyway. So it's just kind of one of those ironies of ironies, right? Right. They say they don't want to tax people, and then they tax people. It's right. Just, it's just not their people. They, what they really mean is they don't want to tax their people. They don't want to tax the top 20%. They're fine taxing everybody else. They just don't want to tax their people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let's dive down into number three. Uh, I think at this point, I think we're ready to uh, go into that, and that is this persistent myth that the permanent fund is a rainy day fund. There, I mean, there's a lot of myths surrounding the PFD, and we've talked about a lot of them, but it continues to be pushed forward. Angela Rodell uh, had a uh, opinion piece in the ADN here the other day uh, that continued to push that narrative. And you, you say, are you offended by that kind of narrative or, you know, what's your take on that? <laughs> here's, here's the, here's the the really interesting thing. And Angela posted this article or, or this article was published in the news miner in the, in the Juno paper. It was, it's all over the state and, and it's a vision for Alaska's financial anchor. And she talks about, you know, how Alaska is going to move forward and talks about, you know, the permanent fund revenues, the earnings from the permanent fund finally being, you know, their day has come that they can fulfill the, the, the purpose for which they were always intended, which is to, you know, supplant or provide revenues when, uh, when oil is no longer uh, sufficient. The, the fascinating thing I find about these, these sorts of pieces from Angela and others is it doesn't mention the PFD. If you, if you word search on this op-ed from her, you don't find either the word dividend or PFD at all, not, not mentioned at all. Here, and, and, and basically, they go back to 76, the, the original amendment, and they say, oh, that, this was intended as a rainy day fund. It was intended to you know, provide for Alaska uh, 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 when oil was no longer able to do it. Well, no. That's not what the 76 Amendment said. You, if, you, if you talk to the people uh, at the time of the amendment uh, or at the time of the constitutional amendment, they say, we don't know what we had in mind. What we had in mind was to, was to stop spending all this money, what we had done with the royalties <laughs> that we got in 72 from Prudhoe. Right. We, just, we wanted to put it, stick them in a savings account. We didn't know what we had in mind. Um, but in 82, it was the, when, we did the, when they did the PFD amendment, it was very clear what they had in mind. They had in mind, as Governor Hammond said at the time, they had in mind half for uh, uh, Alaska families through the, the PFD and half to be available to government, uh, half to be available to gov- for, to, for government spending uh, when oil was no, was no longer sufficient. And that's the last word. That's the, the 82 amendment. Uh, or the 82 statute is the last word uh, uh, on the issue, and it's never been changed since. So, if you want an expression of what the permanent fund earnings were intended to be used for, it's in the law. The 82 amendment or the 82 statute tells you what it is. Now, now, people, I've had an argument with Josh Revac, who said, "Well, but that's just a that's just a statute." Well. In '82, they thought statutes meant something. Right. That was, <laughs> that, that was that's the law. The 2017. Right. That's right. That was before the 2017 Supreme Supreme Court decision. Right. So they thought they were doing something in '82. Right. Next time and I get but next time I get pulled over for going over the speed limit, I'll look at the guy and say, "Well, that's just a statute." <laughs> right. I mean, that's yeah. just a statute. See how see how well that flies. But all of these articles, all of these op-eds about, oh, it's intended as a rainy day fund, they're just ignoring – they're just ignoring 82. They're, 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 they're overstating what happened in 76 with the constitutional amendment, and they're absolutely ignoring what the legislature did in 82. In 82, the legislature told us what it was for, half for government, half for, the, half for Alaska families. And you know, writing stuff like this, uh, writing pieces like this – when you when the 82 statute is still on the books it's just I'm, they're making stuff up 
they're they're not being honest with Alaskans when they when they when they when they make these arguments. And, shocking, and it's, shocking. And it's disappointing that you've got leaders like Angela Rodell who are doing that. Shocking. They're not being honest with Alaskans. Brad, tell me it ain't so. I mean, come on. Tell me <laughs> tell me it ain't so. Shocking, I tell you, that they are kind of trying to bamboozle. Uh, maybe intentionally, maybe not. Maybe this is their whole point of view and this is what they really believe. But again, this idea that somehow, uh, you know, government should have access to... I mean, I love how they're talking about this. Well, maybe we can give Alaskans a $500 dividend. I mean, that would be, you know, we could maybe see our way clear to do that. Um, when again, by statute, we're owed thirty two hundred dollars plus. It's uh, it's a little shocking to see kind of the arrogance of some of these maneuverings. It, it is. It, it just ignores the statute. I mean, for people to say what the what the government intended, what was intended in seventy six was to have this have this as a rainy day fund to have it available uh, when uh, when when oil was no longer sufficient and that's all we're doing now to just completely ignore the history of the 82 statute uh, is just I, it, it's dishonest it, it, it is it, it is it is ignoring policy that was set by statute by the legislature signed by the governor enacted into law that no legislature subsequently has had the votes to overturn uh, it, it's that's what it is. I mean, people say there's a conflict between the POMB law and the PFD statute. There isn't. When you read the statute as a lawyer, when you read the statute, uh, it's clear that the PFD is supposed to, by statute, is supposed to come out of the PF, POMB draw, and that what government gets is what's left over. That's how the statutes work uh, right now. And to completely ignore that. To just to just write the 82 statute out of out of out of existence without the legislature having having changed that statute is um, as I say it's dishonest it's dishonest with Alaskans it's leading Alaskans to think they don't have they don't have rights it's leading Alaskans to think that they've just got to give up on this stuff uh, in a way that the that the statutes and state policy uh, uh, doesn't provide. And I find it convenient <clears throat> that people, you know, say, well, you know, we, we would follow that law, but we'd be breaking this other law, which, by the way, came into view, you know, after the fact of, you know, again, as you point out, technically not breaking the other law. It just means that they would have to find other forms of revenue to fulfill the remainder of the state gu- the state budget. But again, I find it ironic that they're using it as a lever to say, well, we can't bust this law because now we've got, even though one has premacy over the, you know, one was already in place, you know, at some point you got to say, look, you can't, you can't have these conflicting laws. You've got to, you've got to basically apply all of them. You know, what, what those two statutes do is say, you, you, I, if you read the statutes, what they really say is if you want to spend more for government, uh, then, then you, then you're going to get from traditional revenues plus what's left over from the POMB. You've got to raise other revenues. That's what that. That's what that statute really does. You can't take it from the PFD by statute. You've got to. You've got to raise other revenues, or you've got to, or you've got to cut spending. And and you know, you go. Let's go back to Rasmussen for a second. She just doesn't want to do that because raising other revenues mean you means the tw- top twenty percent would have to would have to contribute. To, contribute toward toward the cost. So they don't want to do that. So they just ignore the statute, ignore the 1982 statute and say, well, I guess we just got to cut the PFD because there's right. there's just nothing else we can do. But <clears throat> right. that's, that's not what the statutes tell you. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I just, again, I find it ironic that they utilize one against the other while ignoring the, the truth of the, uh, of the actual verbiage of the, uh, of the statute. But again, uh, and I don't know if it's intentional or it's just kind of the way their mindset and the way they see things. It is uh, it, it, definitely interesting to watch, uh, to say the least. Final thoughts here, less than a minute here. Uh, final thoughts, Brad, for the weekly top three. Well, I I, I commend what the minority is doing uh, in the, in in the House. I hope they continue it. I hope the governor uh, uh, gets the message that he's got backers in the House and uh, and strengthens uh, strengthens what he does at the end of this process. Uh, and I and I and I know the minority is or the majority is is realizing they're going to have to deal with the minority, a, a unified minority now when they get to uh, when they get to the reverse sweep. So I can I commend what the what the minority is doing. Keep it up, doing a good job, guys. Well, I hope they use the reverse sweep as the tool that it really needs to be. Uh, I'd really like to see some things get swept back 
uh, into their proper place, <clears throat> which would be the, uh, the the Constitutional Budget Reserve. Uh, all right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael's old, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.